Rose and take your Bibles and open it to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. This morning, the focus will be on how Christian women, both old and young, can honor the Lord and adore the gospel of Christ as Christian women, as and, and fulfilling the design that God has given them um, to live out here in this earthly life. Titus chapter 2, I don't know if I said Titus chapter 1, but Titus chapter 2. And let me just read uh, from verses 1 through 5. Titus chapter 1. I'm sorry, Titus chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. The word of the Lord reads, But as for you, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. Older men are to be temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in faith, in love, in perseverance. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good, that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be dishonored. Paganism, as a general mindset and way of life refers to a to non-religious to a, a non-religious persons who delight in sensual pleasures and material goods and the time that of which the, uh, in which the new testament was written particularly this letter to the folks at crete and the background or the culture of the people of Crete live a very clear and thorough paganistic lifestyle. But much like that time, nothing is new under the sun, and we find ourselves as a church of Jesus Christ, and um, both men and women, uh, Christian men and women, surrounded by modern versions of paganism that still includes ancient old practices of the supernatural, spiritism, witchcraft. I mean, we see that all throughout in terms of uh, what's being played out on television or screened on the movie theaters or streamed through our uh, devices. Just a proliferation of the idea of people practicing and, and celebrating and exalting as if it's something good or normal or should be normalized. The idea of, of ancient spiritism and ancient witchcraft. But for the most part, what we find in our, in our culture are people that are non-religious in the, in the classical traditional sense, particularly those that... Part, uh, and, and particularly in rebellion against the Bible and the Christian faith. We live in a culture that is saturated in, in a, enticing sensual pleasures and, and revealing it again as if it's something that, if it's not normal, it should be normalized, particularly as we see it through, broadcasted through our social media and our pulp culture, uh, forms of entertainment, and of course, such a, a focus on material goods, and that's always going to happen in particularly cultures that are prosperous, like our country and our culture, and, but even so, you can have even materialistic people in, even in when, in, when they're seat in a culture of poverty. The point is, is that you find that this approach and way of life is destructive to the structure of life that God has built into the human race. It makes people self 
destructive because it makes people self-loving. And if they are to look to spiritual, if they are to pursue spiritual, spirituality in their lives and they're seeking spirituality in all the wrong places and from all the wrong sources and in all the wrong people or beings because they're not seeking spirituality from the only one who could provide it, which is God, particularly his Holy Spirit. Through the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. When people were led to Christ, as we find in the New Testament, they had to be also taught how to live then for Christ. And this is particularly true in Paul's letter to Titus, where he tells the older people, the older men and the older women, what is expected of a Christian older person. And he tells the younger people, the younger women and the younger men, what is expected of them. We're not told who first evangelized the island of Crete. Paul did not. As far as we can tell from Scripture, possibly it was the natives of the island, at least those who were God-fearers, perhaps even Jewish natives that went to, the day, that went to Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost because they are, there, are, there are mentioned there those who are from Crete. In Acts chapter 2, verse 11. But nevertheless, Paul seemed to have felt a responsibility to organize the churches there. And he, and he tasked one of his spiritual children, Titus, to be the one in charge of doing that. And so in the passage before us here in Titus chapter 2, he begins the great task of reorganizing the lives of the Cretan Christians. He wants them to know the type of conduct that is becoming to a Christian. He addresses the male and the female, the young and the old. Why was this so important? Because the Cretans were viewed by Roman moralists as preeminent in wickedness. Notice what it says there in chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. Paul, the word of God through the apostle Paul, talks about the Cretans that it, and, and their culture um, this way. One of themselves, that is, um, one of the prophets of the Cretans, not a Christian prophet, but one who was among the Cretans, said this of their own of his own people. Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. Now, in our day and age, that would be really politically incorrect, right? I mean, that would be one of those where people would just be, in our, in our time, be so offended that you could just stereotype a people and just generalize a whole culture. People would be afraid to single out any nationality or ethnic group and expose their besetting sins. Yet the Bible is much more candid, isn't it? Because it is God's word to humanity, not to his people, but also speaking about humanity and, and, and the sins that humanity really cater to in their own lives. And, and not just individually, but eventually individual sinners form a culture of sinners. And in that culture, whatever traits and habits and person of personalities and and other practices eventually get entrenched with the habitual practices of a culture, including cultural sins. And so the Bible recognizes that sin is not only individual, but you also find it manifested culturally, and it manifests itself in different ways in different groups of people, whether it's the Canaanites in the Old Testament, or in this, in this case, the Cretans. And this must have been really bad because the Bible is not exaggerating here to say that they were always liars. Right? Lazy gluttons. Evil beasts. 
To say that a culture is always this, this way just tells you how much in terms of their own depravity was deep, had deep roots in that culture. And so they were viewed as liars, avarice, lazy, passionate, and central. And these tendencies in their character, no doubt, had a damaging effect on their family life. Yet Paul did not look upon their depravity as a reason to leave them alone. On the contrary, the gospel went to the island of Crete, Cretans. There were some Cretans that became saved. Churches were formed, and now um, he cared enough about them for the gospel ministry to continue to have its wide and deepening effect in a transformative effect in the hearts of people. So he wanted to make sure that these churches were well organized with qualified godly leadership to withstand false teachings that would seep into the church as well as to, to mitigate whatever and, and deal with and battle with any um, sinful baggage that would still be in the lives of the Christians who came out of this culture, who were, who were regenerated out of this culture. So he didn't leave them alone. He saw them as a challenge to, um, to the tremendous liberating and cleansing power of the Spirit of Christ. In other words, the Spirit of Christ can cleanse and liberate anybody and anyone for, from their enslavement or bondage to their sinful sinfulness and their sinful traits. Amen? Christian women today find themselves in the same kind of world, especially like, like in the world of Crete. Christian women today have the same opportunity to demonstrate in the way that they live the beauty of living in and working for their home to the honor of God and the advancement of the gospel. In this passage, then, I want to ad specifically address the older and younger women in the local church. That is, in our church. And for those who may be visiting from other churches, this is how you ought to live as Christian women. And so, I want to be able to explain God's word and what God's word has to say about the core role of young Christian women, particularly those who are wives uh, uh, with children, and we have plenty of them in our church, and the responsibility of older women in our church to encourage these young women to fulfill their primary duties. And we find here two ways that Christian women adorn the gospel. Christian Two ways that Christian women adorn the gospel. The first way is addressing the older women here in verse 3. Verses 3 and 4. And that is when older women exemplify and encourage the younger women. They adorn the gospel. Older Christian women adorn the gospel when they exemplify and encourage the younger women on how to adorn the gospel in their lives. Notice the immediate context of chapter 2, verse 1. It says, Paul exhorts to, uh, Titus here, but as for you, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. So in contrast, notice there, but as for you, Paul is bringing a contrast there with the false teachers of Crete. The false teachers who... Um, wanted to pay attention to Jewish myths and commandments of men who turn away from the truth. Verse 16, who profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him, being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. That kind of contrast. But as for you, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. That, term, that description, sound, is... Is, is a word that we have in the Greek from which we get the word hygiene. That which is wholesome and healthy, correct, sound, true. True Christian teaching enriches the lives of believers. Why? Because the Christian message is the only message that offers salvation and peace with God 
through Christ alone. It then calls the saved to a godly Christian life. And that life also has an evangelistic purpose. So older women are to adorn the gospel and, and make it attractive to those who look on by counseling younger women to do the same thing, as well as in the context, it, it applies to the older men and to the younger men as well. So we find then in verse 3, older women likewise, just like the older men, need to live in such a way that, li that, th that their lives would be in accordance with sound doctrine. So what kind of older woman adorns the gospel with her life? It is the kind of life whose conduct is exemplary to younger women whose counsel is an encouragement to them to live a life that honors, that truly honors God and advances and upholds the gospel of Jesus Christ in their lives. So we see, first of all, that they are to be exemplary before the younger women. They ought to have an exemplary conduct. Notice what it says there in verse 3. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine. So older, an older woman's conduct has a demeanor that should exhibit her inner character. Notice it says there that they are to be reverent in their behavior. The English translation there is not by accident. It's certainly not a mistake. It's certainly not by accident. It's a term that was used in inscriptions to describe the conduct of a priest in a temple. So her demeanor should reflect her inner character, her appearance, her walk, her emotions, and notice her speech. They should be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips. They should not be slanders. Uh, they should not be people, uh, they should not be women who like to be talkative in such a way that spreads really um, bad reports or speak evil. In other words, entertain and spread evil reports of, about other people. So her appearance, her walk, her emotions, her speech should have a certain dignity that reflects a devout and reverent frame of mind. That includes also not being, to be sober-minded, and, and in other words, to not let herself even be enslaved to much wine or to other, what we would call even chemical to even get herself into any sort of chemical dependency. To just kind of bring out and, and expand the implication of what that means. Apparently this was an issue for women on the island of Crete. They were hard drinkers. But, to, but in terms of being a hard drinker and being under the, 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 the influence of, let's say, wine... In a habitual basis is basically being now chemically dependent and idolatrous towards that. In other words, there's an enslavement, there's a bondage there. And I'm glad that the, that the, that the Bible uses the term that, uh, that would refer to bondage because that's what addiction is. We need to under, have a biblical understanding of what addiction is. It is a sinful bondage to something. And so Paul is letting the older women know, don't get yourself into bondage or don't return back to the bondage of hard drinking, of, of being dependent on wine, of being enslaved to wine or to any alcoholic drink or, or to have any chemical dependency to just expand on the implication of that. Don't let yourself be enslaved to that, for you will not then be sober-minded, and therefore you will not be reverent in your behavior. Your demeanor will not then agree with sound doctrine, because your way of thinking and your way of 
of behaving will not be sound because you will be under the influence. You will not have a reverent frame of mind. A mature Christian woman then is someone who knows that the Christian life is serious and a holy thing reflected in the way that she carries herself. Now, verse 3. Here, not only in verse 3 do you have the, the, the significance of providing an exemplary conduct, but also prov uh, before the younger women in the church, but providing excellent counsel. Excellent counsel. Notice that they are to be what? Teaching what is good. So older women are to teach what is good. Since God forbids women to teach over men it, um, in uh, church gatherings, and this is not a reference of formal instruction, whether preaching, teaching, in formal gatherings of the church. Rather, this is a teaching ministry that they could give in the gathering of women, like we will have next month, in a few weeks, with our women's conference but in a gathering of women, or privately. Now, I didn't define yet, and the Bible doesn't really define what an older woman is, except that if you perhaps look at 1 Timothy 5 as to the widows indeed that ought to be put on the list of, of a church in order to be perpetually supported, and that they also need to be faithful, they have to be of a certain age, right? They, what says there in, in 1 Timothy 5, that she is not to be less than 60 years old. But we can't really take that dogmatically, that this is a, a, a hard and fast idea that a mature Christian woman is, has to be at least 60 years old. I think because they are to teach what is good, and particularly in the next verse, that that means training and encouraging younger women with regard to their responsibilities, they, it seems to give the idea here of women who already are experienced in life. Perhaps they have raised their children or at least have been married long enough and have raised children to at least an old enough age where through all that time, they have grown spiritually because they have been applying habitually the word of God to different circumstances and seasons of life. In other words, these are women who are spiritually seasoned because they are habitual doers of the word of God in all areas of their life, particularly in all areas of their Life as a woman, the responsibilities as a woman, that now they can impart that biblical wisdom to the younger Christian women. So I don't want to necessarily say that the Bible says that you have to be of a certain age. You could have much older women who are brand new Christians, and so there might be some catching up there with regard to biblical wisdom. But nevertheless, they probably have a lot of what we would call street wisdom that needs to now be, you know, understood and filtered, uh, you know, through the filter of Scripture. And their wisdom can still be invaluable. But ideally, the, these would be now Christian women who now, looking back on their lives, can understand biblically how a woman's life needs to be lived. Perhaps they have lived it for many years, and now it's time for, it's, it's a ministry of them to pass along that wisdom to, uh, to younger women. A ministry that while it, can be, uh, 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 while it can be taught from the pulpit by men, nevertheless will call upon women to be a resource that come alongside of younger women on a much more personal level and practical level that uh, another man could not do without perhaps crossing the line of inappropriate uh, inappropriateness too often today people have the notion that older people have had their day of usefulness and ought to make the way for the young 
But here, as we find in, in, the, in this passage, as well as throughout Scripture, just the opposite is true. With age and experience comes wisdom. So older women, don't run away from your age. Actually, embrace it. To run away from your age is to embrace vanity. There is nothing wrong with admitting your age and even admitting that, yes, I'm an older person. I am an old woman. Because if you're an old Christian, then you are probably wiser than most people in the room. And that's something to accept gladly and wholeheartedly. You are a resource, a resource that many churches do not draw from, and that's unfortunate. Even in our church, we need to perhaps do even a better job of drawing from the resources of our older women because they have discovered the the quote-unquote secrets of godly living in relation to their husbands and children and neighbors that could save younger women a lot of unnecessary grief. Because those secrets are, have been played out in their lives because they are in the Bible and they've been living out the Bible in their lives. When the unavoidable trials come to the young woman, who better to guide her through than an older sister in Christ who has been through it before? Amen? It is important for our local church life the younger women have contact with older women. So young women, make appointments with the older women in our church. Make appointments, seek them out. And older women, you better make yourself available. You better make yourself available. You are to be teaching what is good. In other words, you are to be encouraging the young women. You are to be exhorting them and spurring them on to train the young women in our church so that they can honor God in their lives and adorn the doctrine of the gospel of Christ. It is clear here that Paul is referring to young wives with little children, but and so older Christian women are well suited to provide by example and by word the help that younger sisters in Christ need. That's discipleship. That's the very heart and soul of local church ministry. The caring of souls And older women then are to be disciplers of younger women. And if you think that you cannot be that discipler, then you need to look at your own life and say, am I really walking with the Lord? Have I been walking with the Lord? Because if you've been walking with the Lord, then you can disciple. That means you know enough Bible and you've been applying enough Bible in your life to now let other people know this is how you should honor Christ. This is how you glorify God in your life, right? If not, then what have you been doing? How have you been living your life as a Christian? Stop running away from that responsibility. Older women as well as older men. But I'll get to the men next month. Last but not least, stop running away from that. And stop underestimating the value you have to disciple others with the amount of knowledge of God's word that you have in your life. Even if you don't think it's much knowledge to begin with, you have enough to to be living a life that honors Christ. And if you don't believe that, then you haven't been living a life that honors Christ. So let's get to work on that. So what areas do older Christian women ought to And what areas older Christian women ought to encourage the younger women in order for them to adorn the gospel of God in their lives? Well, this leads us to the second way then Christian women can then adorn the gospel in their lives. And that is when younger women, as exemplified and encouraged by the older women, fulfill their own core responsibilities to adorn the gospel in their lives. And there are seven core responsibility. So I only have like about 10 minutes here. So let's see if we can, I can summarize these as much as possible. The first core responsibility, notice the older women are to what? Be encouraging, verse 4, the young women to do what? To first love their 
husbands. Men, pay attention to this. Because sometimes you just think that women are there to serve you, and they are, but you're there to serve them. And one of the ways that you can lead them well spiritually is to facilitate their ministry, to enable them to fulfill this with gladness, with joy in their hearts to the glory of God. And for the gladness of your own heart, do not stifle your wife and the mother of your children. So pay attention to this as well. The first responsibility is to be a husband lover. Is to be a husband lover. The roots of a wife's responsibility is to love her husband. That goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 2. And I think some weeks ago, Gonzalo preached from Genesis chapter 2. And 1 Corinthians 11, 9 makes it very clear that the man was not, that God did not create the man for the woman, but God created the woman for the man. So the young married woman is invaluable to her husband. He, uh, he needs someone custom made to help him be and do what he can't be and do by himself without her help and encouragement. He will have glaring gaps in his life. So it's not good for a husband to be left alone. So young women, young wives, take heed of that. Be a husband lover. Now the issue here is not whether a wife should or should not work outside the home. We even see in Proverbs 31 that the, that, that blessed woman, that God-fearing woman, the one or the woman that a husband can trust implicitly, completely, whose worth is far above jewels, is, is a very enterprising woman. The issue is not whether she could she should work outside the home. Rather, the question is where her primary focus should be. Her husband should be her primary focus. This is a high calling, and it is a calling to, be, uh, to being available to him, giving him time, energy, and priority. Second core responsibility, she is to be a child lover. Notice, she, they are to be, the older women ought to encourage or spur on the young women or train them to love their husbands, to love their children. Again, you might think, well, it's kind of strange that a woman would have to be told a mom would have to be told to love their children, but this must have been a special weakness of, of the character of the Cretan women. But, like our own day, more and more women view children as an imposition rather than as a gift or as a blessing. Many women today are scared by the thought of having children. Many professional women feel ambivalent about expanding their family with children because they have a, a career to pursue outside the home, of course. At the same time, those that do have children are encouraged to limit their motherhood to, to their, you know, the, their maternity, maternity leave. And then rush back to their more important work outside the home. But scripture honors motherhood. Mothers have the opportunity to mold minds and develop another person's potential because of their time nurturing that child from, from within the womb until many years after their birth. The child needs his or her mother to be there, to be focused on him, to recognize his problems, to support his or her, uh, to support him or her, to guide him or her, see and listen to their son and daughter, love and want their son and daughter. Writing in the Stanford University Observer, Dr. Albert Siegel warned, quote, when it comes to rearing children, every society is only 20 years away from barbarism. 20 years is all we have to accomplish the task of civilizing the infants who are born into our midst each year. The infant is totally ignorant about democracy and civil liberties, respect, decency, honesty, customs, conventions, and all manners. The barbarian must be tamed if civilization is to survive, unquote. In practice, this means that if you're a mother with younger children, you belong at home with your children more than you belong outside the home at work. Now, I do need to say this. Because we do live in a fallen, imperfect world. 
full of sinful people who do sinful things. And so I recognize that there are women, including some in our own church, who have no choice but to enter the workforce. Because you're widowed or divorced or abandoned. Perhaps you're married to a man who is sick or disabled and is unable to work outside the home for his family. You need to know that you're under God's providential care. You're under his providential directions and governance of your life. So not only does he know what you're going through, but he, he has providentially governed it that way. So therefore, he is on your side. He knows that you are doing double duty. He cares for you in this fallen and imperfect world. He will honor you for your hard and faithful work. The third core responsibility is to be sensible, to be, which means to be prudent. To be sensible is to be discreet and wisely cautious about sexual matters. Your work outside the home, especially among men, means that you need to exercise caution and prudence in your dealings with other men that is appropriate appropriate. The fourth core responsibility is for a young, woman, young Christian woman to be pure. Again, this nuance is very similar to the similar one. This, the nuance here is to be chaste. It has to do with the propriety in the sex life. And in a world that encourages loose and immoral behavior, the young Christian woman is to cultivate a pure mind and manifest a chaste demeanor. That's not just an issue for men. There's no reason for a young Christian woman to advertise her sexiness or her sex appeal through social media. Out in the public, don't be like unbelievers who cheapen themselves by doing that. And, leave, and, and on the other side, leave yourself special for your husband. The fifth core responsibility is to be a worker at home. To be a worker at home. This is... Keep, this has to do with keeping home, to be a homemaker. And this is God's assignment to the young wife. A woman is serving the Lord when she is serving the needs of her family. And a Christian mother, and a wife and mother is to be a homemaker and value it. The world, especially feminists, scoffs at this notion of the importance of a homemaker. It is because, and, and, and I believe this, I, I think they, they scoff at it because uh, they have fallen to the same cursed mindset that the ecology of the home is not fundamental. It's not that valuable. In fact, they, they have seen also that men have devalued them and have devalued their work at home by taking their wives and their children uh, and the mother of their children for granted instead of praising her regularly like we see at the end of Proverbs 31. The men should praise their wives that fear the Lord. But women today devalue it because not only the men devalue it, but because they also crave the public recognition and the so-called, quote-unquote, loftier pursuits that men experience and value more than valuing their own wives and their, and their own homemaking climate that they provide for them for the glory of God. God-given roles and assignments and their eternal rewards are much loftier pursuits than what any man can offer in this world. Amen? The sixth core responsibility, quickly, is to be kind. This, this is self-explanatory. She is to be a woman who seeks to treat well all the members of her house. And the last thing, the last core responsibility, the seventh one, is to affirm her husband's role. Notice, to be subject to their own husbands. Significantly, this is not just about fulfilling a role. This is having an attitude of submission towards her husband's role. It is her affirmation of his role over her and over, her, over his own home before the Lord. And having this attitude is to be like Christ who submitted himself to the will of the Father. 
So, what we find then is that this is, well, for, the, for the ladies, this is such a great opportunity to honor their lives, to honor the Lord with their lives. But there's one other opportunity here, and it's at the end of verse 4. Women are to be this way and carry out these fundamental core responsibilities in order that the word of God may not be dishonored. In other words, by doing this, it's not just about the people in your home. It's a much bigger goal and much bigger objective. It's an eternal objective. It's about upholding the gospel of Jesus Christ before others. A Christian wife's behavior will have an impact on her Christian, non-Christian neighbors. The gospel makes a woman a better wife and mother and in turn makes her a better representative of Christ and his gospel and a better member of his church. So the scriptures are given to you as a blueprint for life, ladies, to show you in spite of your past how to become a good wife and mother to the glory of God and to the advancement of the gospel. So the question is, is your life and your home scriptural? Do you want it to be? Well, we're here to help you, especially the older women. And you adorn the truth by following these principles of the word of God. Amen? Amen. Because of our time, let's stand, and I'm just going to go ahead and close with a doxology. But as I said before, if you want to know more about the gospel of Jesus Christ, please see me or any of the leading men or, or ladies in our church. And then at the same time, uh, ladies, take advantage, particularly young ladies, take advantage. Seek out the older women in our church. Older women, make yourself available to the younger ladies to disciple them as well and continue to encourage one another as we were even exhorted a couple of weeks ago. Let me read from Jude 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. And all the people of God said, amen. Happy Mother's Day.